I'd like to open this chapter with a story. A very cliché story. So cliché that it pains me to recount it, but here it goes. One day, while enjoying a meal at a restaurant, Pablo Picasso is interrupted by a fan, who handed him a napkin and said, Could you sketch something for me? I'll pay you for it. Name your price. In response, Picasso pulls out a charcoal pencil from his pocket and swiftly sketched an image. The man reached out to collect the napkin, but Picasso withheld it. You owe me 100,000 francs, he said. The man was outraged. 100,000? Why, that took you no more than 30 seconds to draw. Picasso then crumpled up the napkin and stuffed it into his jacket pocket. He replied, You are wrong. It took me 40 years. Whether or not the story is even real, it is a very famous and popular tale which raises to the surface both how people popularly conceive of art, as well as the problems we face when attempting to rationalize it. It demonstrates some interesting concerns. What is the value of artistic works, and how exactly is that to be determined? For the longest time, art has eluded me, personally, as a concept. I've wanted to know why and how pieces of art get their price. Why is some art worth billions, and some art worth nothing? It feels like the answer has always stood aloof from me. I believe that this is because the answer to these kinds of questions have always come from liberals, and thus, the answers I am given are bourgeois-oriented in nature, and blind to ideology. I personally just cannot accept that. I believe this is a problem faced by more Marxists than just me. I think Marxists in general have had a troubled time understanding art. Even in the totality of Marx and Engels' writings, the men who wrote volumes, the topics of art and artistic production only amount to around 50 pages of short paragraphs on the topic. Not to build a straw man, but when I hear someone talk about the production of art, it is usually in a liberal attempt to rebuke Marx or his theory of value, that there is no way that the price value of art could be concluded by measuring the socially necessary labor time, and that Marx's theories are insufficient at coping with the fact of artistic production. What I'm here to argue is that Marx's theory of value does have the ability to account for the cost of certain artistic production, while also containing certain limitations which Marxism, as a greater ideological framework, absolutely has the answers to. Before we begin, I want to go over both the main strengths and weaknesses of this theory for full transparency. The main strength of this theory is that it will tell you why certain artworks are worth $7, while others are worth $2 billion. The main weakness of this theory is that it cannot accurately define exactly why an artwork is $7 instead of maybe $8, or the difference in why one artwork is worth $2 billion instead of $2.1 billion. Another weakness, which would be fair to point out, is that there are so many nuances within the art world that it is often incredibly difficult to provide a comprehensive analysis. Its counterposing strength is that I do honestly believe should you encounter anything in the art world which is not accounted for here explicitly, that the groundwork has been laid out for it to become eventually incorporated, that this is not a static theory. If the aforementioned weaknesses of the theory don't bother you, then everything should be smooth sailing. To actually begin talking about artistic production, we need to become well acquainted with the actual producers of art. It is not only important to analyze the form that labor takes within the artistic process, but also the relationship that art producers have with their products, and what their overall relationship is to the capitalist society around them. We can do this by beginning with a very simple question. Who makes our art. From this simple question, we are presented with a not-so-simple reality. The reality that different types of art are often made under entirely different methods and conditions. For instance, what's the difference between these two works of art? 
One, the real, actual Mona Lisa, and the other, a Marvel movie poster I found online for six bucks. Certainly, many dissimilarities are jumping out at you, and this is a perfect example of what I have in store. Though there are many dissimilarities, let's remember which ones are most important to us. The form of the labor, the relationship between producer and product, and the relationship between producer and capital more broadly. What about between these two? One, the Starry Night, the other, a 2002 Burger King Spongebob toy you can buy for 75 cents. From these two examples, there is a pattern to be derived which will follow for all other examples of art and media in this script. That all art within capitalism was either made by people who look like this, or by people who look like this. These pictures don't actually help reveal the relations between producer and product, nor between producer and capital. They do, however, allow us to visually examine the labor process of these groups. Compared to the images before, these men are experiencing a tangible division of labor, only participating in one aspect of the total production process, aided by increasing mechanization for the purpose of, or at least the capacity for, mass production. In reality, we know that in order for these men to find productive work within these conditions of alienation and mass production, that they must be employed as waged laborers, enrolled in commodified relations. As such, we actually do get clued in quite well as to the form of the labor. Waged labor. This is the vague pattern that we're going to be moving forward with, that there is an art made under commodified relations, and an art which is made outside of commodified relations. This is not the only distinction in types of art, but this is where our distinction begins before it will become more complex. To delve into the complexities which spell out the price value of art, I give you a quote from Marx and Art by Dr. Martin Hurst. Quote, most artists do work outside of a direct commodified relationship with capital, and very few are employed directly by capital as productive labor. The exceptions are these small armies of assistants who realize the artistic vision of the art world's megastars. So, for most artists, there is no correspondence between their work and the labor theory of value. The cost price of artistic works bears little or no relationship to the necessary social labor time of the arts worker." End quote. This quote, too, correctly divides the population of those who live off of the production and sale of artistic works into two camps. But in order to make our language more consistent for a Marxist theory of art, we're going to change some words around, and instead of referring to the two groups of art producers as armies of assistance and arts workers, we're going to use the terms arts workers and artists, respectively. The corrected quote then reads as follows. Most artists do work outside of a direct commodified relationship with capital, and very few are employed directly by capital as productive labor. The exceptions are the arts workers, who realize the artistic vision of the artists, so for most artists, there is no correspondence between their work and the labor theory of value. The cost price of artistic works bears little or no relationship to the necessary social labor time of the artist. This is true. Most artists work outside of a direct commodified relationship, because that is what defines them as artists and not arts workers. Keeping with the relationship expressed in the quote, an artist writes a book, but the arts workers make that book. This is not the only form of relationship that these two groups can take, but it is useful in revealing the specifics of the labor process which distinguish them. Artists, in the proper sense, are artisans. They are non-alienated laborers whom receive payment in exchange for finished products and are expected to be fully capable of independent production. 
When you think of artists, you can think of pottery and glassmakers, authors, painters, musicians, and the like. These people, even if they are currently in contracts with some studio, are supposed to be able to produce and sell works all on their own, with their own talents. Arts workers are proletarians, with a division of labor, whom are paid in wages regardless of product, and are engaged in socialized production. You can think of animators, print shop workers, textile workers, video game studios, and such. There are painting companies who will come paint the walls of massive buildings. Those are definitely arts workers, and not artists. Before the internet made CDs obsolete, there were workforces of people whose job it was to buy large numbers of CDs and burn music onto them for sale. These were arts workers, and not artists. I hope the distinction is clear and well understood. I mentioned that arts workers running around as the assistants to the artists is not the only way their relationship can be orchestrated, and I'd like to further explain that. Artists, being artisans, are capable of producing their works on their own. A singer can sing, a painter can paint, and a glassmaker can blow just fine without any outside assistance, no matter what, so long as they have the right tools. But they are not always independent of one another, and the arts workers know this well. Arts workers do not produce original works, and this is a rule with very few exceptions. The vast majority of all art produced by the arts workers are simply replications of works by popular artisans, or are under the direction of artisans, such as in big production films. However, we must also make room for things like stock image companies. Shutterstock, from what I can tell, is thoroughly corporate, so perhaps we say that arts workers are, very rarely, capable of producing new works. Even though these are still led by a creative director, the labor process is thoroughly commodified. So artists are mainly independent from the arts workers, but arts workers are not usually independent from the artists. There are also relations where artists are dependent upon arts workers, and relations where certain bourgeois relations are dependent upon the artisans. Artists become dependent upon arts workers in relationships such as between an author and a printing house. Obviously, today, authors don't have to sit around and painstakingly produce every single copy of their books themselves. Understanding the artwork in order to produce it became no longer necessary, and now you can simply print out as many sheets of words as you want. The printing house makes money by selling shipments of books to bookstores, and its workers are paid in wages. The people who actually physically produce the books are paid by the hour, whereas the author of the book receives a royalty payment for each individual sale. Anytime there is a royalty system going on, there is a dependent relationship from the artist on the arts workers. Bourgeois relations become dependent upon artisan labor in relations such as between a social media platform and its content creators. Hearst states that in, quote, music recording and distribution, mainstream film, and even platforms such as YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok, quote, artistic labor has a direct relationship with capital, end quote. There is a major caveat to this statement, though. This is not waged labor. And these people are not arts workers. This is a commodification of artisan labor, and there is a difference. Not a single professional full-time YouTube creator has ever earned money on a salaried basis, nor do they earn any amount of wages per hour. Even if they have contracts with YouTube, their income is reliant on the number of times their products are consumed. Hearst mentions that, quote, for example, some content creators on TikTok are paid directly by the platform which appears to commodify their labor, even though the payments, approximately 4 cents per 1,000 views, are minuscule and totally unrelated to a wage concept, end quote. This is in stark contradiction to those platforms themselves, like YouTube, 
which makes all its money from investors and groups seeking ad space within those created projects. What you have, then, is a social platform that has built up bourgeois capitalist relations on top of artisan labor. For anyone who's confused as to why we're adding things like YouTube videos and TikToks to the mix, allow me to explain. When we're talking about artistic works, we're not just talking about the art that made it to the museums or to Hollywood. We have to talk about everything. We also can't just look at the normative types of art. We have to look at anything that anyone can be able to perceive as artistic. Painting, sculpting, metalwork, and architecture are all well and good, but a mason jar can be appreciated for its craftsmanship the same as a painting. And I do also mean to include things like cartoons, movies, books, postcards, company logos, stamps, designed clothing, etc. That being said, we must then acknowledge that the vast majority of people who are involved in the physical production of our cartoons, movies, posters, pottery, video games, paintings, and literature are all not single, isolated individuals with extraordinary talent, but are a mass conglomerate of people who work on behalf of a commodified art industry, who mass-produce pieces of culture for profit. Though our understanding of the producers of art has divided in two, I have failed to fully explain that this results in our understanding of the production of art itself now dividing into two. The product of the arts workers, and the product of the individual artisan. Likewise, this affects the price of artistic works as well. Simply put, if the explanation for the production of art itself divides in two, then the explanation for how art gets its selling price must also be divided in two. We will begin with the product of the art's workers, which takes the name commodity art. They are elements or pieces of culture which have been created for the purpose of sale on the market. How does commodity art get its price then? In no particularly special way. Let's evaluate it. A video game is 60 bucks. A poster is 40 bucks. A book is 20 bucks. Our cartoons are 7.99 a month or 79.99 a year, and a stamp is 50 cents. Speculating on their cost of production, this makes a lot of sense. For all of these, you have to imagine the material cost, the cost of the labor, and the potential for profit. Suddenly, the world of art seems quite more recognizable to the Marxist view of things and quite more easy to wrap our heads around than if we did not distinguish between artisanry and commodity art. Commodity art is nothing more than a commodity which wears the skin of an artwork. There is nothing special about it. It functions in accord with all the same laws and principles of a commodity that Karl Marx and Frederick Engels laid out. The people who produce them are waged workers aided by mechanization, with a tangible division of labor, organized into neat rows of worker bees. Aside from the intensity and content of labor, there is nothing that genuinely distinguishes a video game studio from a factory shop in terms of its aims of production, relations of ownership, and methods of surplus extraction. But what of this other art, then? What do we call it? and how does it assume its price? Unfortunately, answering this isn't as easy as answering the last one. As Hearst stated, most artists do work outside of a direct commodified relationship. This presents a bit of an issue. Marx's theory of value is an analysis of how value functions within a capitalist system, where free competition and generalized commodity production reign supreme. The law of value is good for comprehending how commodities obtain value under social relations of mass production and free enterprise. Remove those conditions, or something comparable, and you're no longer dealing with commodified relations. You're no longer working with value in the way that Marx analyzed. Then, are we to say that here, finally, is where supply and demand is an adequate answer? Hardly. 
but most economists and researchers seem to believe so. This even includes our beloved Dr. Hurst, when they state, quote, The value of art is determined by market forces, the simple arithmetic of supply and demand. According to critic Michael Finley, the value of a work of art is dependent on size, and also on factors such as media, colors, and the reputation of the artist. Overall, Finley observes the price of art is governed by supply and demand and marketing. Thus, the Mona Lisa is said to be valued at $2.67 billion today. The Mona Lisa reaches this astronomical estimate because of its rarity. There is only one, and its provenance as being a work attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. End quote. And sure, you could claim that all that's going on here is supply and demand, that the rich, or any group, have their specific preference, and are simply willing to pay what they can for what they like. While supply and demand can never be an incorrect answer for these types of economic situations, we must recognize that supply and demand are not at a constant, and are not ubiquitous. Thus they are secondary factors, factors which are influenced by other primary factors, and cannot be taken as the whole answer. It is entirely too surface level, and Marx himself remarked, when talking about the prices of commodities, that, quote, If the price is determined by the relation of supply and demand, by what is the relation of supply and demand determined? End quote. For us, perhaps we might say, if the reasons given are that of marketing, and because it is a da Vinci, then what are the particular methods and arguments for that marketing? and why do they even care that it comes from da Vinci? If the answer is popularity, my question has to be, what makes someone popular in the first place? Such questions may lead to the discovery of a much higher game being played out, a game that can perhaps only be noticed if you are paying attention from the very beginning. As such, we need to put a pen in our place and go over how something becomes and remains one of those venerated historical pieces. We begin where all good artists do, in the home. The first thing to note is that not all art created outside of commodified relations is going to be worth billions or millions, and is more likely worth nothing at all. You can craft away in your home with a paintbrush in hand, and still never produce anything that is ever considered noteworthy. Thus, it cannot be explained via analyzing the production process, and also means that this divides into two. It divides into common art and national popular art. This is where the previous chapter is going to come in handy, as an understanding of art's role in politics is essential. The creation of any piece of art cannot be isolated from its time, place, reason, method, etc. The total social and physical reality. All art tells some type of story, whether you want it to or not. Therefore, it has a position and a philosophy. This is the social historical reality of art. It comes from the social mass and informs the social mass. This really ought to bring you back to the first chapter, because we're talking about works like the Augustus of Prima Porta, the Statue of David, and the stories of King Arthur. And if you were paying attention, then the reasons for their importance should already be well known. The reason these pieces of art are deemed as important is because hegemonic apparatuses and organizations which dominate over society have deemed the worldview projected by the artwork in question as imperative to both the articulation of the ideology of the organization and to the dissemination of that ideology to the broad masses. It follows a fairly simple concept. People like to put things in their homes that they like and don't keep things in their homes that they don't like, so you can expect the contents of someone's home or personal dwelling to at least somewhat accurately reflect the taste, personality, and interests of that person. 
People don't put things in their homes that they don't want or appreciate in some way. There is nothing a person puts in their home that isn't a reflection of them, or some aspect of them. If the bourgeois state is the home of the bourgeoisie, then the art of museums, national monuments, galleries, radio stations, schools, airports, casinos, and corporations shouldn't be judged any differently on an ideological level than how you or I might attempt to discern certain beliefs, views, or aspects of a person based off what items they display around their home. From the very top to the very bottom, from the structure of a building to the interior layout of a building to the decorations which adorn that interior, are all reflective of and reflect on the values of the owner and of capital more broadly. It is through this dissemination and popularization of narratives which allows their social structures to become normalized and legitimized. There is nothing objective that denotes any piece of art as necessarily important or great, only that it is believed to be such by the society it is placed in. It is believed to be such because majorly noteworthy and influential associations have told them it is such. By its very nature, the status of a piece becoming national popular is something which is decided from the top down. Nothing makes a piece inherently important or influential. It becomes so after the fact. After the essence, message, or what have you of the artwork has been deemed important to the essence, message, or what have you of the group in question. Now, is this to say that Art can only gain popularity or notoriety via the social organs of the state and ruling class? No, because even though we're thinking of individuals as members of larger social groups, not all groups are representative of the state and ruling class. There exists room for the development of a legitimate counterculture, and artworks can gain popularity within subterranean elements of the population. These artworks become popular, perhaps even greatly, but they are not national popular, and almost never become as revered as those which gain that status. Every social group evaluates artworks as use values, and determines their usefulness to the narrative of that group as a piece of propaganda. When the groups or institutions in question are the ambassadors of the ruling class and state, they are likewise looking for works which they could deem useful to the preservation and naturalization of their ruling order. Because this is situated within a capitalist framework, there are those artworks which are deemed as useful to the capitalist mode of production, and those deemed useless, or not equally useful. Therefore, even within artisanry, there is a division between productive and unproductive labor, unproductive or productive, to capitalism. National popular art is created because it contributes to the overall reproduction of the total conditions for capitalist production. These works are run through the state machinery, all of its ideological filters, and become integrated into the national narrative. The national narrative is the foundational myth and justification of all modern states, and is taken into those national art associations, which are plainly just bourgeois institutions. The national bourgeois associations naturally make up the largest and most prestigious groups of the social strata, where all attention and direction flows, and as such, wield the largest accumulations of social capital, and with it, fairly enormous amounts of real capital. To demonstrate the truth of what I've just stated, allow me to use some examples. What is the foundational myth of the United States? Freedom, or liberty. The idea that you are at the very least more free here than anywhere else. I hope we all know what I mean when I say that. Freedom from or to do what exactly? Don't look too far into it. We're just free here, apparently. 
which is precisely why in the 1950s the CIA began funding propaganda campaigns across Western Europe and North America, which were targeted against the cultural policies of the USSR. The aim? To make people believe that the Western capitalist powers offered greater realms of cultural, political, and economic freedom than in the socialist countries, and that everyone ought to be absolutely sold that this was the American century. There were many, many, many groups funded by the CIA, but arguably the most successful of these was the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which ran from 1950 to 1966. The CCF very successfully internationally promoted abstract expressionism, an art style which originated in New York City and has today become internationally renowned. Interesting. As an art style, it lacked structure, and in comparison to the socialist realism of the socialist countries, looked less manufactured and less controlled, more aggressive, spontaneous, and organic. The CIA funded hundreds, if not thousands, of notable authors, poets, polemicists, and other intellectuals. The extent to which the CCF operated cannot be overstated. The exact numbers are hard to come by, but there were thousands of people involved. The CIA gave them millions of dollars to take on any anti-Soviet-leaning intellectuals, whether on the right or the left. The CCF is responsible for the wealth and careers of George Orwell, Pablo Picasso, Jackson Pollock, and many, many more. This was not simply the CIA giving away money, either. Francis Saunders, someone who was actually involved in the CCF, stated, quote, The individuals and institutions subsidized by the CIA were expected to perform as part of a propaganda war, end quote. If you think that's interesting, think about this fact. Not a single regular person has ever had any say in who should win a Grammy. The heads of the Recording Academy decide that. That's why the winners always say, I'd like to thank the Academy. We also all know just the kind of prestige that's associated with winning a Grammy. Another thing you might find interesting to think about is all the books that you read in public school. I've already mentioned George Orwell, but that is merely an overlap. All the books which are part of the national curriculum are part of a literary canon, and are absolutely the most fundamental to disseminating the ideology of the modern state. If popularity is a race, the bourgeoisie build the track. If culture is a conversation, then whether it be the Recording Academy or the CIA, Instagram or YouTube, the bourgeoisie and its representatives in civil society both dominate over the entire discussion and typically own and control the channels where discussion is born or sought out in the first place. This has not changed and cannot change. One Vox article notes that to even get in a gallery, quote, gallerists often visit art school's MFA graduate shows to find fresh young talent to represent. These shows are the first arena, the first entry point for a lot of young artists. End quote. In other words, it's state institutions training and facilitating representatives of bourgeois culture to get picked up and filtered through the greater bourgeois associations. This does reveal the last thing I really feel the need to explain, an understanding of the distinction in the levels of national organizations, between lower level, medium level, and higher level organizations. Lower level organizations open their ranks very frequently, and are often the places where people go to learn how to do art. These are your art academies. Medium-level organizations take on up-and-coming artists from the lower-level organizations, gradually assimilating anyone they believe they could benefit off of, and act as the middleman between the lower-level and the higher-level associations in the art world. These are your art galleries. Higher-level associations open their ranks very infrequently, and only take on artworks which have already been made prestigious 
or brought to their attention through the medium-level organizations. These are your national museums. With that, I do believe we are ready to unpin our place in talking about the price value of national popular art. To reiterate, but for the last time and all together now, usually getting any work of art actually on display, in an auction, or on the radio is not as spontaneous of an event as you might have once been led to believe. The entire ordeal requires an intense amount of politicking, marketing, and social maneuvering on behalf of the artist, in a bid to get associated with the groups which can actually get you on the radio or in a museum, or what have you. Typically, these groups don't go out of their way to search for new works to put on display, unless it's apparent their old attractions are failing. Typically, it's the other way around, with artists doing whatever possible to get noticed by the major art associations, producers, what have you. The deciding factor being, of course, how closely and profitably they believe they can incorporate you and the narrative your art reinforces into them and theirs. It is not as though these prestigious groups and institutions are running at the artists with open arms. The bourgeois associations open their ranks at limited times, and are picky with whom they let in. Even on freely accessible platforms such as Instagram and YouTube, all participants are still subject to their terms and conditions. It's still their platform, and they will remove you as they see fit ultimately deciding who is popular and who is not, who they like and who they don't. They incorporate artworks into the national narrative, and they are made into parcels of the narrative, and are evaluated as they relate to the whole. Since the national organizations or associations gain access to more wealth and resources the closer they're associated with fundamental aspects of the state and ruling class, these two things scale together with lower-level organizations selling and buying works for hundreds or thousands of dollars, medium-level organizations buying and selling artworks for thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, and the higher-level organizations and institutions, which are more central to the dissemination of ruling class values, buying up works for millions or billions. There is a certain constraint which exists in the medium-level organizations, which is one of the notifiers that it is a medium or higher level organization. That even though some groups, associations, institutions, etc. might be paying more for some works than others, there is a certain minimum which they must negotiate, and this is dependent upon the needs of the artist to acquire their means of subsistence. There is thus a certain monetary constraint levied on the medium and higher level organizations which does not exist in the lower-level organizations. Going further, the higher you make your way up the chain of bourgeois associations, the more well-known you have to become, and the larger a market there grows associated with your name. There becomes, from this, a large competition between buyers in the higher-level associations. This does have an effect on driving the prices up ludicrously high. Art, at least within capitalism, becomes national popular art because it serves a role in the overall reproduction of capitalist society. This is what differentiates the artworks of Van Gogh from that of you in your home. It has to do with the way it is made and whether or not it is valuable to the capitalist system. It has to do with the form of the labor, the relationship between producers and product, and what their overall relationship is to the capitalist society around them. This is why the in-game poster is $6, the Mona Lisa is $2.6 billion, and my art is worth nothing at all. Because there is a distinction between commodity art, national popular art, and common art within the capitalist system. At the end of the day, without understanding the ideological game being played, the equation may look like simple supply and demand. But of course, we have now exposed the answer of pure supply and demand as nothing but liberalism, 
blind to bourgeois ideology, believing none to exist, when really it is everywhere. I want to finally end off talking about the price value of art by explaining away the story which I had opened this chapter on. Having explained everything, this shouldn't be too hard, actually. When an artwork is incorporated into any institution, it and its creator are elevated to the social position of that institution, and become permanently linked to it. Picasso was a major star of the bourgeois art world. One day, he is approached by someone who was, consciously or unconsciously, an advocate for the bourgeois associations. This person approaches one of their star ambassadors and asks him to make something. When naming the price, the consumer was shocked at how high a price something could fetch for being so effortless, unconsciously applying the laws which govern capitalist production onto non-commodified relations. We understand that the artist is not restrained by the law of value, so this should come as no surprise to us. It should be wholly expected. There is nothing surprising, marvelous, inspiring, or unpredictable about the story. It is entirely by the books, so long as you are made aware of the greater ideological context and apply an analysis. There is, born from this, a lingering and burning question. If it is true that all art is reflective of ideology, and it is true that, as I had said, from the very top to the very bottom, from the structure of a building to the interior layout of a building, to the decorations which adorn that interior, that they are all reflective of and reflect on the values of the owner and of capital more broadly, what then are the values we can determine by looking at the art of our modern society? This is an important question, and is one which needs to be answered. However, not in this chapter. Thank you.